Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session on shaping the future of health and healthcare systems with our dynamic panel uh, drawn from uh, a range of, of sectors. And if I just uh, run through uh, who we have here with us, uh, starting to my immediate left is Shobana Kamaneni, who is Executive Vice Chair of Apollo Hospitals, etc., in uh, India. Uh, next uh, to uh, Shobana is Gong Yingying, uh, founder and chairwoman of Yaidu Cloud from China, uh, who works in data tech and AI. Uh, Next to Ying is uh, Christoph Weber, who's President and Chief Executive Officer of Takeda uh, Pharmaceutical in Japan. And then along the end, the new head of UN AIDS and former head of uh, Oxfam International, uh, Winnie Bian uh, Yima. So you can see we have multilaterals, we have pharma, we have uh, digital sphere, and we have uh, healthcare uh, provider today. So, uh, when we uh, talk around uh, shaping the future of health and healthcare, uh, we need to scope what are the trends, and we've been asked in this session to talk about disruptive trends. What's thrown everything up in the air over the past uh, year? What, 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 what might we learn from this uh, going forward? What, what do we think might come out of thin air in the next five years, which will influence uh, uh, health, uh, health and well-being and, uh, and services? And just at the, the headline level uh, on disruptive events, uh, clearly the re-emergence of Ebola uh, in DRC has been a, a significant uh, uh, concern. And where it occurs in a, in a conflict zone, particularly uh, hard to, uh, to grapple uh, with. And now we also have a coronavirus, uh, which is uh, uh, causing Dr. Tedros to be cause, uh, chairing a meeting of the International uh, Health Regulations Emergency Committee as we speak, and we understand there'll be a statement from WHO uh, late today, a disruptive event. Uh, also of concern has been uh, the decline in vaccination rates in a number of countries, leading to uh, significant measles outbreaks. My own country is one of those affected. Uh, but let me uh, also uh, reference Samoa, which with a population of 200,000 people has had 5,697 cases, uh, it's said to be 2% of the population with 83 deaths. So this is really quite, uh, quite devastating. Uh, so one of the issues has been the extent to which the anti-vaccination uh, campaigners are responsible or to what extent it's, it's public services not reaching the poorest and marginalised to get the, uh, the benefits of vaccination. Of course, we also have the opioid uh, crisis, uh, significant concern. Uh, in a number of countries, but, but then there's an upside. There's new therapies, there's new treatments uh, uh, coming on board. Of course, then the question that must follow is, are they affordable? Are they accessible? Uh, will universal health coverage be achieved? Uh, we had the high-level event at the UN General Assembly last year. Every member state has signed on to it. Uh, across sectors, people are for it. But uh, are, we, are we going to get there? Will there be global action following uh, global uh, declarations? So uh, we have, as I said, a, a panel from many sectors. I'm really going to probe them on what they think are, have been the disruptive uh, things, what we can learn from them, what's coming uh, you know, down the tunnel at us as we endeavour to shape you know, resilient and capable healthcare systems uh, for the future. So I wanted to uh, begin with, with uh, Winnie Bianyema, because Winnie has had such a strong focus uh, both uh, at Oxfam until recently and now at UN uh, AIDS on advocating for the most marginalised for the poorest um, and for sure people living with HIV and the key uh, populations at risk are among those. So Winnie, throwing the ball to you first. Thank you Helen and good afternoon. From our world, the world of fighting HIV and AIDS, last year was a year of a lot of progress. Let me start there. 24 and a half million people are now on treatment and another 15 though, million are still waiting to get on treatment. So progress, but then still a big journey for us. We also saw 
reductions in new infections. They've been coming down. But still, last year alone, 1.7 million people were newly infected. So we're not at the end yet, but it is declining. 770,000 people died of AIDS. That's unacceptable. We are at a point where we can stop AIDS deaths. We are at a point where the science for prevention, the science for treatment is there. But what we saw last year for the first time is that the increase in new infections is mostly among those we call key populations. Gay men, men who have sex with men, sex workers, prisoners, people who inject drugs, those on the margins of society. That brings me to the point mm -hmm. you just made, that actually it is inequality. Millions are being left behind, not because the science isn't there, but because we make choices that privilege the mainstream and not the weakest and the poorest and the most vulnerable. It's an issue of rights, the human rights of, of sexual minorities are at stake here. Criminalization, stigmatization, discrimination. In Africa, the face of HIV AIDS is the face of a young woman. It's about sexual violence. It's about social norms. We have to address these. We have to continue looking for the science and some new medicines came up last year. But without removing the social barriers, addressing the human rights issues, repealing laws that criminalize, we will not win this. Mm. Thank, thank you, Winnie. Uh, wise words, and we'll come back uh, to those themes again. Christoph, uh, from where you sit, uh, what's, uh, what's been disruptive? What's been happening that has implications for, uh, for the sector? Well, first, uh, if you uh, look at the theme of uh, Davos uh, this year, it's about uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm and uh, stakeholder capitalism. And I think uh, that's very important. It's a, I, I think it's a real turning point, and that will help a lot to reduce inequalities and to make sure that there is more equal access uh, to uh, treatment in, in the world. And I, I really embrace that, and uh, I think it's very important for any actor in, in uh, healthcare. Um, one major disruption is the fact that we can live longer. And that's, uh, that will continue. I mean, many of us, uh, statistically, will live until 100 years old. Now, the question is the inequality. So who has access to that longevity? But that, that's uh, an amazing uh, disruption that we are seeing. The challenge with this uh, longevity is that uh, it doesn't come free. It's, it's actually expensive. Um, uh, bec because, uh, of course, uh, you live longer, but uh, healthcare is becoming more important as you are getting uh, um, uh, old, older. And so this is very important that the society is able to, to uh, understand that longevity means that financing healthcare is very important. Mm -hmm. The disruption in innovation, one of the reasons for this uh, longer uh, longevity is is uh, in new innovation uh, in, uh, in uh, treatment and, and technology. And I think the next decade will be amazing in terms of the new technology that we will see. Uh, we, uh, we, we see an acceleration of new treatment, uh, new prophylaxis, because we understand better the, the biology. And, and uh, uh, every year, we see more innovation than the previous years. And that's, that's uh, really exciting. The key question is how do we finance that, how we make it affordable, and who has access to this uh, innovative new treatment that are coming every year. Mm. Thank you. Ying, coming to, uh, to you from the sort of technology, AI side, uh, what, what would you like to reflect on as disruptive trends, y your sector being one of them, of course? Very exciting one. <laughs> um, so before this meeting, Christoph asked me why I started this company. And uh, at the beginning of this meeting, Helen said, how can we make everything affordable? So that was uh, why I started, this is why I started the company. Because um, um, on one side, that, uh, you know, we have uh, you know, a 
a global aging population that are, you know, 290 million elderly in China now and reaching 400 million in 2035 and probably 2 billion elderly uh, globally in 2050. And also the demand of healthcare, you know, we are sub-molecule profiling patients that doctors cannot process those data anymore. And, but on the supply side, you know, in terms of drug development and uh, clinical services, we are still very uh, not primitive. We are not technologically advanced. So a lot of the infrastructure work that has to be done to make uh, raw data to be evidence and also to, uh, you know, to enable uh, things like clinical practices and drug developments and better patient care. So. That's why we started com this. Com that's why I started this company, and uh, and to use AI and uh, and uh, uh, medical data technology to make healthcare more affordable, more accessible to the greater population. Mm. Yeah. So we have seen very positive results over the past a few years in terms of uh, active monitoring drug developments, you know, significantly incre uh, increase the efficiency of clinical trials and also more active uh, patient management. Yeah, mm. so that's where we are now. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Shabana, <laughs> bringing in a perspective from another uh, extremely large country yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> endeavoring to provide services there. No, it was fascinating actually coming, you know, in this order that, yeah. that we heard about you know, viruses and what's going to happen in the world, the, uh, that we're shortly going to uh, get to, the, uh, to, to, to this uh, longevity escape velocity that you can choose death and uh, data that is driving it. And I'm reminded of a song, just kind of get the, the singer. I'm sure all of you have heard it. We didn't start the fire with that. And, and he really talks about his, sings the history so fast, and that's where we're at. We didn't start the fire, but the thing is, we're right in the middle of a raging, very complex fire. So, you know, we have to address the micro communities. We have to address people that don't have access to care. We, have, we address people who can actually pay for everything and have money left over. And then, you know, dying becomes an option. But in all this, and this happens in every country, even in India, that, you know, and, and so, and you have to give great outcomes. So, it, to bring down this huge complexity that we live in, I think that we have to center it around that patient. Mm -hmm. and, and what has made that patient uh, different from what he was 10 years ago? And I think it's information. In India, it's the capability that 350 million of them have a smartphone. Um, I've seen this in the US. Many of them don't have to go to a doctor anymore. So you know, you're finding new ways of being able to uh, disseminate health information to get better outcomes, to manage diseases, to NCDs, which are really, you know, that, that are going to take trillions of dollars out of this world today. How do we keep those costs down? So on one side, I say we have more enabled patients because of data, but we also have significantly more challenges that will, that will continue to hit uh, countries' GDPs not just, you know, like in India, for instance, at $75 per capita patient, lowest in the world, US is 10,000. We still spend something like 10%, 8%. The government spends only 1.5%, but the rest is spent by the private. It comes out of your own pocket. But we can't afford this if, if you want to grow, a country that wants to grow, and suddenly, you know, you're having more than 10% to 20% of your GDP sucked out by healthcare costs in one way or another. And it's not directly to hospitals, but it's all the social determinants of health. I think that's a big challenge of today. And, and then I think that it's also the fact that uh, how is it that we're going to break down these silos? Because they're fantastic solutions. We're a very resilient world. We're going to get over the viruses. We're going to find a way to contain them, just like we did some great work on AIDS. And, and we continue to push the envelope on that. We're going to find better diseases, uh, even though there's going to be, you know, resistance that will come from different parts of, you know, uh, uh, the world and overuse. We're going to find the fantastic use of data and how we can use artificial intelligence. All of us, there's not a single healthcare player 
that, that, is, that is not using data. And finally, I leave you with one thought that today now we think of the world as, as bionic, nothing more than healthcare. And bionic is not about a body part that works much better, but it's about the merging of technology and biology. And biology really comes down to the humans and how we can work technology to work so much better for us. So we've got an age-old problem, which Winnie's articulated, which is of, of those who are really left behind and, and marginalised for a, a range of reasons. We've got uh, the issue of the ageing societies, uh, well known in the West, but now very much uh, coming down the, the, the track for, for, for China and, and, and India uh, also. We've got all this innovation in the, in the digital uh, sphere and in the, the, the therapy and, and, and treatment uh, uh, sphere. Uh, Winnie, uh, coming back to you, UNAIDS has always been known for its very people-centred, human rights-based approach, engaging key populations. Does that lead you to make some, some broader observations about the in engagement of people and communities in designing the care and services that they need? Absolutely. Mm. I think we are where we are. The success that has been achieved ag against this epidemic is really because of communities and particularly communities of people living with HIV. Let's not forget it was gay men in America, in Europe who got up and fought for their right to life and we supported them, the rest of civil society, to bring the prices of medicines down and to put now the 24 and a half million people on treatment. It took communities, it took people asserting and claiming their rights. But today I fear Helen because we are now in this SDG world and it's universal health coverage, not universal health care. And the coverage thing seems to be more about bringing the private sector in. A way, a way we are saying that public provision isn't possible. Now you need a health insurance paid for by sold by profit makers. This is going to leave people behind, in my view. This is going to leave behind communities. Communities have been the ones supporting and even providing HIV services. When you go to Africa, for example, you will find small community-based organizations are part of the delivery system, particularly the prevention side, helping people to understand how to prevent young girls, young men. It is communities. Now, without that, the approach is more about giving treatment. It's about putting people on treatment. That's the main focus. Yet it is prevention we should be at if we are to end this disease. And prevention is the work of communities. It is communities who educate children, who help families, who put in place the ecosystem you need for people to live without a virus. So yes, communities, rights are at the center of this epidemic. It's not just a disease. It's a social justice issue. It's an issue of poverty, of exclusion, of denial of rights. These are things that are solved by communities. The approach of focusing on mainly on health insurance systems sold by the private sector won't get us there. Mm -hmm. So, Shobana, with your hat on as a healthcare provider, uh, how do you see the, the, the engagement of communities in designing, you know, the, the, the systems that are going to most benefit them, the interaction with, with, with communities? I, I believe that communities will make a difference. And as long as they're educated enough, they need to make those educated choices. And I don't think there's an either or also in terms of do you choose between leaving some, uh, not having health insurance or, or, you know, I do think that health insurance, creating access, uh, that's really going to help a country like India, for instance. Our government is trying to uh, put 500 people under, the, 500 million people under, you know, the, uh, uh, the socially challenged people into health insurance. But now we're pushing back and saying, how about the rest? 
why don't you make it mandatory that people can pay, have a small insurance. The others that can afford it can do a top up. But you look at Thailand, you look at what even Rwanda, what Korea did, and all these other countries. I do think that insurance is A, important. And then you start working in the communities to make sure that they do the right preventive. And, and they're the ones that can make a difference in terms of the way, you know, how do you work with, uh, uh, we've, we've created a community in some of our villages where we've planted alternate trees for nutrition. So you have one that provides iron and the other one that provides another micronutrient. So now they're trying to have community gardens that, that they can create food and nutrition. And I do think, so it's simpler in a village, it's tougher in an urban community, but I do think that buildings after buildings, housing societies, so as much as condition management is important, there should be a new terminology, like you said, of, of doing conditions from communities. Mm -hmm. Ying, the, the tech sector, um often is thought of as, as designing things which uh, <laughs> are satisfying and interesting to it, but not necessarily having people at the, at the centre of it. So well, would you like to reflect on uh, how technology and artificial intelligence is going to respond to, to people's real needs? We're, we're conscious that with, with AI, you know, who's designing the algorithms? We've got an absence of you know, sufficient numbers of women in, in, in the sector that you're in. Can you perhaps <coughs> share a little on that? Yeah, the good thing, in our company is uh, mm. uh, half of our scientists are uh, physicians, mm. right? So, so we have a uh, data scientists, we have uh, you know engineers, we have uh, we, you know we have architects, but we also have uh, a lot of physicians and doctors that we work together to design those algorithms. Mm. But a friend of mine used to say a thing that really impacted me that we focus so much on sick care. We don't focus enough on healthcare, and another. And I also believe healthcare is a, is a, a care. It's not a transaction. It should not just be a, a service. So, so really, that uh, you know, for specific use cases and for a specific disease, the needs of the patient varies so vast, so significantly. Our mission exactly is, is to use AI and data platform, as, co as cold as it sounds, mm -hmm. but it's actually the only, well, at least I think, it's the only way, affordable way, to provide more personal care mm -hmm. that is accessible to the mass public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let, let's come then to what, what's really going to shake up uh, the health and healthcare in the next uh, five years or so. And I'm going to come to you, Christoph, because your, your sector is a, a very innovative one. What do you see coming down the track as some of the really big, big developments? Before I, I, I go there, I just would like to uh, mm. insist on uh, the uh, robustness of healthcare system. I'm not using uh, universal health coverage, or, but I think uh, a country is, is, a, is as good as its healthcare system. And the healthcare system should be designed to cover the entire population. I think a healthcare, a healthcare system is as good as not the best covered, but as the least covered. That's, that's where you measure how effective your healthcare system is. Not the population which is the best covered, but the population which is the least covered. And I think this is, this is what we should all focus on. How can we improve the healthcare systems? If you are a country today, which spend 10% of your GDP on healthcare, there is a lot of data showing that three points out of the 10 could be optimized. Mm. Uh, it's wasted, it's mass mismanagement, or, and, and yet you know that you will need to spend more because of the trend of aging population. That's the work we have to do, is to optimize healthcare system, making sure that there is nobody <coughs> left uh, behind, and, uh, and, and progress li like that. And, and it's difficult, if you, even if you, when you look at developed countries, United States, Europe, everywhere, the healthcare system are far from perfect. And I mean, this is a huge debate in every country. And I think this is really where we should continue to uh, focus mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And back to your question, because the innovation that is coming will accelerate this um, tension, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, because the innovation is not, uh, uh, is not cheap. Innovation is, will always be expensive. Mm -hmm. So the concept of affordability is how can you 
how can you finance uh, innovation, but uh, when, uh, when you treat for the first time a disease it, it is, oh, and you increase the longevity of people, it is often an incremental cost. Sometimes it's not, but often it is. So I think this, this, is, this is what we need to be prepared for, because gene therapy is coming, cell therapy is coming, we will, uh, we will uh, 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 people with cancer will survive for much longer. Uh, many cancer are now a chronic disease. Um, we might cure cancer one day, but you know, it's not for now, uh, except in a few, a few cases. I think it is, it is uh, extremely uh, exciting to look at the future, but there is a challenge of how robust the healthcare system are to uh, face that, uh, that tension that is coming. Mm. Winnie, you want to yeah. come back in? Yeah. A number of things. I want to agree with you that really it's the health system and you will know how good it is by seeing how well it caters for the poorest, most vulnerable. Mm. But yes, the problems that I see. And I'll use two examples. One is in Africa, the face of this epidemic is the face of a girl, as I said. Out of every five infections amongst adolescents, new infections, four are of young girls. Imagine four out of five young girls. This is clearly an issue of protecting young girls, preventing them from getting infections, a lot to do with sexual violence and so on. Now, PEPFAR was looking at how it had spent recently. And it found it had spent, for example, on voluntary medical male circumcision, which is preventive, about $5 billion in the region but it had spent only about 600 million on sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. hmm? Imagine the, the, the difference there. The amount spent on voluntary medical male circumcision, the amount spent on prevention mm -hmm. was for women, for young girls. Mm -hmm. So there are inequities in the system and they are worsened <coughs> when you sell health, we get worse. Let me give you another example that shows that point. I met a woman called Victoria. She lives in a slum in Kenya. She was infected when she was about 12 years old. She was raped. And then she found out when she was 16, because she was falling sick, and she was expelled from school. But she fought. And she became an activist, and she got on treatment. And now she's a community volunteer, mm -hmm. communities. She goes to the facility, helps people in the community to go to test, helps women to understand how to prevent it from moving to, from passing it on to their children, deals with so many issues. For all that work she does, getting solving the problems of people from their home to the facility. It's her. She gets, as a volunteer, $20 a month. That's all she lives on in her slum. $20 a month for all the work that gets people from their homes to the facility. The facility is free, OK, it's free. It is gov it's a government provision. But the government doesn't take care of the whole issue. It takes only at the facility. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that unless we have a system where the whole need mm -hmm. is taken care of, mm -hmm. you're passing the burden to a few people in the community. Mm -hmm. They are not paid for it. And this is why I fear about these Mm. health insurance systems that are privately mm. uh, provided, that are profit-centered. They narrow the health care to the facility, and everything else becomes paid for by volunteerism, mostly of women. Inequity mm. continues to grow. Mm. Mm. Thank you. 
We're going to give the opportunity for the audience uh, to, to come in. We've got a fascinating range of perspectives uh, here. Uh, so w when you speak, and I'm going to recognise you right in the front row, just say who you are and please please stand up as, as well. Uh, we are live streaming this and people like to see you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hola a todos. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jorge Alejandro, a medical doctor from Colombia. I'm part of the Global Shapers community supported by WEF. And when, when I was hearing you, I was concerned about the actor who is not present. Who do you think is not present here? You know, it's called stakeholder capitalism. <clears throat> and the government is not present here. So I'm concerned about the fact that more and more public institutions are seem to be relegated in their, you know, in, in their ability and in their responsibility to guarantee healthcare coverage and access as well to the population. So given the fact that we have a good representation of pharma providers, multilaterals, what do you think is the role governments sure. and public institutions should play in actually the future of healthcare? I mean, should they just let everyone play from the private perspective? Should they regulate? Um, no, what do you think? Well, the as the moderator, I've got a strong view of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Please yeah. come in, the, Shabana. The, 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 the government is the elephant in the room. They don't need to be here with this. And I spoke about it when, when I spoke about the government coming in to do 500 million people insurance. And in every country, if you look at uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, or if you look at the NHS, or any country in the world, if Thailand, uh, country after country, the government is supposed to stand up, and that's the basic human right, that they have to provide it with this. But what happens is that when they don't do enough, it's, it, uh, the, the person, the stakeholder, is the patient, is the one in need. And, and all of us serve to them. The government serves them. And when the government doesn't serve them enough, then it's our job with that. And that's where I think that, that, that you have to understand where governments play and we play. Winnie, you, Winnie and Christoph are going to come in on this, uh, <laughs> please. But you see, you have a point. Yeah. And, and I agree with him. Mm -hmm. Governments have been taking a back seat and passing the back to private actors on health. And it is their health is a right. It is a right, it's a human right, it, is, it should not depend. Your health, whether you're sick or you live long, should not depend mm -hmm. on the money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. The government should provide health care. You get up in the morning, you work hard, you pay your taxes. When you fall sick, the government should take care. But they are taking a back seat. Mm -hmm. they are, they, the whole system now is very much about we can't manage, let others come in. But yet we know everywhere where universal health care has been guaranteed, public provision was the primary way. There could be some amounts of private, but public provision. And it's possible. Whether you are a rich country or poor country, you can do it. I keep talking about Thailand. <coughs> Thailand has got like one-tenth of the GDP of the very rich countries. But it is able to provide quality, public health, public provided health care, up to 90% or so, publicly provided. But you're right to say that this question of the right of people to health, we are shifting towards, let us find solutions. And the solutions seem to be lying more and more in private provision. Christoph, come back in. Well, I of course, you need government to step in because otherwise uh, it will not be universal. So uh, if you only rely on the private sector, mm -hmm. they will always focus on the population where they can have the best possible management. And, you know, so if you want to have a truly universal healthcare system, you need government to step in. And in many countries, people are there to remind government that they expect healthcare system. I mean, look in many uh, democracy in many countries, healthcare system is very high on the election agenda. So it shows that yep. people know it's that true. this is a government responsibility. But I think it's very easy also to to criticize government and to say, oh, they don't do their job properly or they don't want to do it. But it, I think it's a little bit uh, cynical to say that because I think this is very hard to do. 
Uh, it's very hard to do. It's, it's not a slam dunk. I mean, uh, uh, I talk to health ministers, uh, this is a headache. To create an efficient healthcare system is very hard to do. Uh, and there has been so many testing. So you say, oh, free healthcare for all. Fantastic idea. Doesn't work. Too expensive. Uh, so what is the balance? How do you manage uh, properly an healthcare system? That's a challenge. That's why they are testing other, other options to have the efficiency of the private sectors, but with safeguards. The safeguards are more or less efficient. So I think that, that's what is going on, is that everybody is trying to build the best possible healthcare system with at minimum cost, if you like, for the, uh, for, for the na nation. And that's, that's very hard. And I think, I think there will be more and more test and try, and healthcare system are better today than 50 years ago. I think in, in, in 50 years, they will be better than today. We'll have a lot of data to optimize as well. But uh, that's what's going on, I think. Mm. I, I've been a health minister. <laughs> 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 OK, there's never enough money, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very hard. It's all about resource allocation. Yeah. Yeah. And you're trying to channel more to the, uh, the health promotion end and get smoking rates down and alcohol uh, consumption down. And, and what was your relation with the finance minister, right? Uh, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> well not, not so good. But <laughs> within the first two weeks, I think, of becoming health ministry, he wanted 2% cuts across every, every department, and that is painful in health. I can't tell yeah. you how painful. So I know a little about the, the strains that our, our ministers are under. And, and, you know, I was a health minister actually 30 years ago. Now the technologies and treatments available are so much greater than they ever were then, so the, the, the pressures are so much more too. Now, we're going to have gender balance in the questions. I want a woman's hand up. I I've got your hand up. You say, yeah. <laughs> because Perfect. we've got because such I a gender balance panel questions. that yeah. we have to yeah. carry on. Um, uh, Alexis McGill Johnson, I'm the um, president of Planned Parenthood, and, um, and so gender was directly in my conversation, particularly because um, uh, when you spoke so um, uh, so beautifully and painfully about the young young girls, really, who are at the um, at the center of um, HIV and AIDS crisis and, and many others, um, we're on the 47th anniversary of Roe in the U.S. and and in a couple of days will be the you know third year of the global gag rule. Mm -hmm. So my question, as we talk at this conference around gender equity, like how are we actually centering gender equity in healthcare for the future? Because it seems like we are really going backwards. Mm. Mm. And I'm going to make the response to your question the last sort of round for the panelists because at uh, 1.43 I need to bring uh, WEF back in to close us up. So uh, gender, health, uh, who'd like to come in? Ying, you yes. haven't had a round for a while. So I, I guess that, you know, there's gender equality and equities in the uh, problem, but there's also, you know, age, right? The, 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 the infants cannot express their needs and, uh, and uh, the elderly, uh, you know, sometimes they have, uh, you know, like they feel lonely and so, you know, how's the sickness, when people become ill, the situation become very, very complicated and everybody is very different. And that's why, you know, I emphasize two things. One is, uh, you know, personal. It has to be very personal and, uh, you know, people have to be empowered with enough information and uh, they have to have, have a will to find out things themselves. But secondly, you know, it's uh, a service, right? It's, uh, it's, it's women, men, you know, it's an infant, it's, uh, it's the elderly, you know. It, there's a huge diversity, you know, I don't want to emphasize partic into a particular group because when people become ill and, uh, you know, or sick, they, 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 they you know, they, it's very personal. It's, it's beyond gender or age or, you know, you know, like <coughs> ethics. It's beyond a lot of things. Right? Thank you. Shabana. You belong to a nice country. Uh, I, I do think that that there are prejudices. I agree with because you. <laughs> <laughs> because you think, if, do you think if, we are moving backward or forward? No, you think uh, it's increasing I, I, I think that, the, that uh, to, even today as it stands, there are some areas in the world, especially in India, if you had a, a male child and a girl child first, you might choose only to have a male. But, but the thing is that, that gender preference is still there. And, and if you have both and they're challenged, they might give the care, they might give the education, everything to the male child. So, so there is a disparity. We cannot take that away. 
and I think this is where uh, the social determinants really are so important mm -hmm. and why we have to continue to push the envelope. And, and the second part of it is where, uh, this is where education and health really intertwine because we've seen in societies where, where the women are more educated, they make better choices, mm -hmm. that not only for themselves, but also for their families. Mm -hmm. so. so true, yeah. Um, Christophe, a, a, a male view, and then I'll come to Winnie. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I, think, I think we should fight against any prejudice and yeah. inequality, and uh, I agree with you, healthcare is a, is a, is a right. Mm. Um, and I, I think that uh, countries are, are focusing on that. I, I, I visit many uh, countries, and uh, the healthcare system, health is always a key priority. But uh, it's very hard to do, and uh, I think I think that um, uh, we will continue to uh, to test and try and improve the healthcare system as we go. I think the disruption of data hopefully will help a lot. Um, many healthcare systems are designed uh, today as they were designed 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very difficult to manage the, the patient, uh, and uh, they are extremely difficult to optimize. Uh, so that I am optimistic that in the next uh, you know, 20, 30 years, healthcare system will be much more efficient. Yes. I'm going to ask Winnie for a minute on a subject she could talk for hours on. Right. Winnie. Uh, First, I want to say that Christoph is not being very honest here. Christoph, if you listen to him, I asked him, I said, you must be French. His accent is French. He's a French man. So now, you have a French healthcare system. There is a health system like the American one. How can you tell me that these two, that this one is also trying the, some system to see how it works? One health system is on, based on public provision. The other one is based on private insurance. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between the two. It's in simple words. Yeah, none, none of them no. are perfect. Yeah, yes, yeah but, but, but I think that one... Yeah. is trying to uh, uh, deliver the human right to health. And the government is saying it's our responsibility to deliver human rights, to, to be a country based on fairness, on social equity, and addressing the barriers that people face to health. But the other one is saying, well, if you can work and get some money or you get an insurance and you're on your own, basically that's the difference between the two, in my view. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm ending by saying that it's a human right and people who, are, who face different barriers, social barriers in society, if you are a woman, if you are a racial minority, a sexual minority, if you combine all of those, you're probably going to suffer more ill health than someone with fewer barriers. And that's why governments must deliver for people. And uh, a, a healthcare system that doesn't give primacy to, pri to public provision is not delivering on human rights. So how to summarise uh, this conversation, which I think will continue in the corridors as we, as we go. Uh, so many possibilities in, in innovation, whether it's the tech sphere, the, the treatment uh, sphere, innovations one hopes too in healthcare delivery, because we can't keep uh, delivering the way we did half a century ago. Uh, the role of government, I think everyone's affirmed is important, but there's a feeling that some are missing in action or not uh, active enough. The demographics are challenging with the uh, ageing uh, society. But uh, come back to the point, we're still leaving people behind. And if the universal health coverage agenda, uh, the SDG agenda is to mean anything, it's don't leave people behind. Design systems that will spread the benefits to, to all. So that's my uh, uh, headline summary, but Wef, you want to come forward, just talk a little, uh, one minute on the platform. Yeah, yeah, so uh, thank, thank you for summarizing so well the mega trends. I think at, at the, at the work we're doing at the forum is very, very aligned with what you're suggesting. I think there are two things to it. That, that's, it's a matter of sustainability, like you said, Christoph. Mm -hmm. The costs are rising uh, very fast, 7% annually. We're talking about 8 trillion in healthcare spending and 2 billion on the planet have no access. So you need to do two things. 
The equation is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Solutions are pretty complex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Keeping people healthy, addressing social determinants of health, protecting population from epidemics, and then people, unfortunately, one day or another will be sick, then providing optimal care, appropriate cost, personalized medicine, and do that universally. So focus on universal healthcare coverage and also on mental health. That is very, very often understated. So that's really where our platform is operating. We are hosting 25 coalition projects on those various themes. Uh, we would be very, very ho uh, hopeful uh, that you express an interest and you want to lead more of those projects moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.